And <clears throat> just, is that the only one that you had trouble opening? The it must be because there's no images that are associated with it. That, that I don't know. I, I have to check with them. But uh, what I will do going forward with any of those is just send you the YouTube link, which will be easier. I mean, it's, it's kind of new. I'm surprised about that. But I'm trying to find the best way to do it. I like the YouTubes because I can find them and I can see them in my files and all that stuff. But uh, we'll see. Nevertheless, we're, we're going back to the wonderful world of the immune system. Aren't you excited? I know I'm excited. You're not excited. Okay. Hey, it's how you defend yourself. And you're going to see a few more of the basics. And then you're going to really see it. And this, we underappreciate the immune system tremendously. And, and the, the difficulty with understanding you know, how much that occurs is the it only it it, it only, when it doesn't work is when it's the problem is when we get sick or something overwhelms it i mean we've seen so much of that and particularly i think everybody got a, more or less whether i i do think the response is somewhat overblown but, you know during the COVID years i mean i know what at least you folks you were all matriculated here before when we when, when did you start last term like a year ago most of you okay so you did, and by that time we had all the, the mask stuff and gone, it was gone. But, but yeah, I mean, we're just classroom like this designed to fit 40 people. We had 10. And uh, so on Mondays, one group, one 10 would come and on Wednesdays, another group would come or Tuesdays and Thursdays, depending on how you allotted it. And then the other ones would be online. So we'd be doing basically this hybrid course. And for the Monday, Wednesday, Fridays, we just alternate weeks with whoever came in Friday. It was crazy. I mean, I, I, like, I understand and all that stuff. It was just nuts. Crazy. But off we go. And so much for my diatribe on that, if that's the appropriate word, and it may be. So this is kind of where we left off. And I, I did want to spend a little bit of time just, just briefly reviewing what goes on with inflammation. Because you see it all the time. It doesn't have to be an infection. It can be an injury. It doesn't mean it breaks the integrity of the skin. Like I said, a sprained ankle a bruise from something. We see it all the time. And that's all part of it. So let me get back to where that area is. So, and again, just to review it, the, when tissue is damaged, chemicals are released. There are zillions, literally, trillions of cells that are damaged and they release chemicals. And those chemicals typically trigger a remarkable degree of response. Initially, what most of them do and, and, and a lot of the chemicals will then activate white blood cells that are always in the region and they'll amplify the response. I it was me or you. Yep, it probably is me. Turn that finger off. Is the first thing it does, it will dilate the blood vessels. The idea is that you can bring effectively, <clears throat> bring the, the, the the elements that are going to fight and correct the situation or improve the situation to the area. <laughs> so hyperemia, increased blood supply. We developed this capillary permeability. The capillaries are vessels that are very, they're nestled very, very closely together. And what happens with those, with th those chemicals will alter it and create tiny little openings. So we get that, that kind of thing. We have additional amounts of fluid. We have clotting factors, antibodies, etc. So redness and heat burst from the increased circulation, swelling from the fluid going in there and the pushing on it, pain. And those are really, you get what they call the cardinal signs, redness, heat, swelling, pain. And so all of those types of things. So it can be result from anything. Locally, infections do that as well. Locally, other chemicals do that. And they tell you about what happens with the fluid. That fluid, it does push things away and pushes them toward lymphatic vessels for processing. Complement in those clotting proteins, what they're trying to do effectively, what your body will frequently do is wall off infections. It, it, it's like, you know, a pimple or a pustule. And generally it gets walled off and it gets, if it's close to the surface, it gets pushed. Out. It's fairly easy to open by itself. You could use warm compresses. There's a different topical agents that, that are, are, are very, very useful for things like that. The reality is when they, if they get into an area where they can't 
sort of open up out and drain, they go sideways. They follow what are called tissue planes. And those are from a perspective of someone who treats and sees a lot of infections. And I did so over, you know, for the better part of a quarter of a century. Those are scary. And I treated a lot, a tremendous amount of diabetic patients. And, the, and those can be immediately life-threatening very, very quickly. So just to give you an idea, yes. And then what happens is the white blood cells are coming to the party. The neutrophils, the macrophages come there. So effectively, we end up with a relative amount of what's called leukocytosis. Again, those chemicals tra traverse or travel through the bloodstream. It doesn't take long for a chemical agent to get through, even if the infection is down in your toe, okay, you're going to get an onslaught of chem chemicals right there. If any of you ever had, it's a little different today. Uh, nowadays, they use agents that put you to sleep very, very quickly if you have general anesthesia. So you use, the chemical that's used most commonly today is called propofol, which was which is, is it's very quick and it goes away very quickly, like that. And, to, and most people don't get that terrible groggy stuff. That's why it's it's used so much. In the old days, they used to give you what was a, a, a rapid acting barbiturate called sodium pentothal or thiopentol, and they'd say count back from a hundred. So they give you the injection intravenously, and if you and if you got nine to ninety eight, you were doing good. All of a sudden, you're out. Next thing you know, it's where am I? You know, X amount of time later. So it's changed quite a bit, but that gives you an idea how chemicals in the bloodstream go quickly. We're talking about an intravenous injection or a, a, along those types of lines, maybe 10 to 15 seconds before that effectively would get to the brain in totally. And so, and once the, the faster they act, the, it means the quicker they get through membranes and things like that. So it induces this onslaught of white blood cells, that's what leukocytosis is. They go from all over. And that's some of the, one of the things I talked a little bit about, touched on it in blood. When your body is continually sending those signals, it's pushing out white blood cells, but they're immature, which means they can't fight. And that's a bad sign. That's something you might remember showing you on the blood test of mine, where we look for certain kinds of forms. So you get a lot of information from this, and it's, and it's all part of it. Just probably show you some illustrations of this. What happens? Those white blood cells, first of all, they're typically along the periphery of a blood vessel or a capillary. And so what happens is they're close to the wall, so to speak, anyway. And those chemicals, what, and it's a very good animation, which I probably should show you, but I don't have it cooked up here it's kind of long. It was done at Harvard about 20 plus years ago. And really it shows you where these chemicals will create little, their concept of what proteins look like. And the proteins would be sort of in the blood vessel pointing this way. And they sort of elongate and latch on to white blood cells. And so when they marginate, they latch on these cell adhesion molecules. And so then they slow and, and even though they're continuing to roll, they're on the sort of, sort of against the wall of the vessel, walking along that way. And then magically, those chemicals that are released allow the white blood cells to sort of slither through the cracks. It's kind of like you're parked in a parking spot. You had to squeeze in and you're kind of coming out sideways. Well, white blood cells can do that, which is, which, is, which is really interesting. So they can almost flatten themselves out. And we have to understand that these are dynamic structures. And red blood cells can do the same thing when they can get around little bends as well. And so all of that chemotaxis, these inflammatory chemicals, causing basically attracting things. Monocytes arrive later. They take a little longer time because they're the cleanup crew. So after all this mess, after this, this event has taken, has taken place, it's like having a big party at your house or someplace. And then you come in the next morning and go, oh, my God. Well, that's the, that's the macrophages, except they, they gobble it up. Good for them. Like, I'm sorry, my wife would yell at me about that. Because you never clean up. I heard that last night. My name was. Okay. So they come there. They, they The transformation occurs. They go from the large monocytes, macrophages, and they basically are the, the cleanup crew. And so it's interesting when we see certain elements in certain samples, they kind of give us a little tail. And they always see this illustration, you know, 
you know, somebody stepped on a nail, if you want to look at it that way, and the little green guys are bacteria and things get into the bloodstream and blah, blah, blah. And, and you go through all the slides. It's not a big deal. And so this is, if you get something out of this slide, great. If you don't, don't. There's not a whole lot to it, I don't think. It's just telling you about the dilation of the blood vessels, the permeability, pain, the swelling, all the things that occurred, and, and really sort of what was discussed with regard to that. I don't necessarily get a ton out of that particular illustration. What's pus? We mistakenly think that pus is filled with infection. And it was, it's one of my pet peeves. And I, when, I, when I work with the nursing students, there's a test that we do. When someone comes in with a wound that's draining, you take a sample of it. You take a swab. Okay? It's called CNS or culture and sensitivity. You'll learn about this in micro. A lot of times they'll just culture the pus. They'll take off the dressing. There'll be yuck on there and do that. That's, that's being lazy. Right? And lazy does not sell. And so what happens at that point, pus has basically dead elements tissue fluid, white blood cells, occasionally living pathogens. But really the source of the infection is down where the wound is. You actually have to clean that stuff off and swab in the base and the sides of the wound. That's where the active particles are. And they're the ones that you have to test. You're testing it to one, identify it. And once you identify it, secondly, pick an appropriate antibiotic. So that's kind of a little bit, depending on who's doing your micro, whether they get into it or not, it, it it's... I gear the micro differently for nursing and health science and health career students than I would for biology majors. And indeed we do that here. We have two different courses. And so what happens is frequently we do have an abscess. Again, most of the abscesses are pretty close to the surface. You could, they can open up or be opened up. A lot of times when they're deeper, they're a bit of a problem. Then we get to these oddball bacteria that are really nasty because they resist being digested. They thrive inside cells. Tuberculosis surely is the poster child for that. So it's a long-term chronic infection. And the way I always describe it when I teach micro is hiding in plain sight. So it's laying inside of the cell, multiplying. And then finally the cell gets the message. And by that time it's too late. Now it's filled with bacteria. And what happens, your body sends additional white blood cells because the cells changing and they surround it. It's called a granuloma granular because remember the granules in the cells and it's like a lump. And unfortunately the combination of events effectively facilitates the inside of that dying and then eventually releasing the bacteria frequently into the bloodstream, frequently from the lungs where tuberculosis starts. And it can spread all over the body. So it's, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's sort of like a bacterial infection that mimics cancer, if you want to think of it that way. So it's, it's, so, and the, this is one of those, and, and just to just get off the track a little bit, this is another one of these diseases that once you have been exposed to it, the potential is always there for it to reactivate. So perhaps in micro, perhaps not, you'll <coughs> learn a bit about what's called latent TB. A lot of people have been exposed. Years ago, we used to treat it. We don't treat it so aggressively now because the medicines are kind of harsh. And the, the distinction is when your immune system, and this is really the center topic, when that begins to go bad, the potential exists for things to recur. Uh, personal anecdote. You know, I, I remember we were talking a little bit about the blood. And I mentioned that my first wife was exposed with a transfusion to hepatitis C. And we stay in contact all the time. But my kids basically and her health has deteriorated, unfortunately. But they told her after she and I were divorced, after being separated for a number of years, that there was a great concern with her health, which has now improved a bit, that that hepatitis C could rear its ugly head. Because it, it, the fact that it wasn't active didn't mean it had. And that would have been much more life-threatening. Just a point like that. <coughs> so that's the, on that last little nugget here. Become activated. So tuberculosis is not a whole lot different. And it's not the only disease that does that. There's a lot of others that are able to thrive. The plague, for instance, can thrive inside of living cells. Uh, Lyme disease can do a certain amount of that as well. That's there. And, and that's a much more real problem that we would face around here. Because everybody, 
we live in Lyme disease central. If you're up here. Like every morning when I walk the dog, there's a couple of deer. Hi guys. The dog gets very excited. He thinks they're friends because they're the same size. And ticks are everywhere. Okay. Antimicrobial proteins are part of this. And I talked a little bit about this. They can either directly or indirectly affect it. They're called interferons and complements. And so they're things that you normally release when inflammation is triggered. Interferons, and there's a whole family of them, and there's different kinds. There's alphas and betas and all that types of stuff. And you can see, but when a cell, a, a cell is infected by a virus, it releases these proteins to neighboring cells basically as a warning sign. It's like, heaven forbid, we'd get one of those things on our phone that there was something bad going on in campus. Effectively, that's, I, mean, I don't like to use that analogy, but you get the idea that that basically is a signal to other cells that we have invaders and you need to basically batten down the hatches, you know, lock things up. And that's kind of what they do. So the interferons, and there's a lot of different ones made by white blood cells because lymphocytes are the ones that fight viruses widespread effects, activates other white blood cells, activates NK cells and macrophages, fights cancer. And so for a long time, getting back to that hepatitis C, the treatment before we had more advances in antivirals, which you hear advertised on TV a lot today. Well, if you have hepatitis C, it's not associated with, you know, one of those, they have the disclaimer at the end. Oh my God, it drives you crazy. But you can see what they do. Now, I'm not aware of them using it on general wards or and there's other medications for multiple sclerosis that are favored today. But this was the, I had a student back 20 years ago who uh, was in a micro class. I was teaching in Chatham at the time for Shadyside School of Nursing. And, and, and it just days that she was totally out of it. And I, I said, what's going on? And she goes, well, I, I, I was exposed to hepatitis C and I have to take this interferon. And, every, and when I take it, sometimes it's just, I can't focus. And there's, so that was a, it was a very harsh treatment. I mean, she was extraordinarily uh, tiny, slender, tiny. She was, you know, very, very, very petite in any event to start. And this is just kind of showing you how the mechanism works, hardening the cells. And you don't have to spend a lot of time looking at that. And the same thing with complement. Now, when I do my advanced physiology students next term, we go into more of this with these variety of different proteins and different factors. And they all play a role, as you can see, when we activate these defenses, they basically reinforce the innate system, which was supposed to pay, protect you basically. And they also impact the adaptive system. And there's different pathways that are there. There's one called the classical pathway. There's another one called the lectin pathway. There's an alternative pathway. And we, thankfully, you do not have to get into it. And all of these different things. So for instance, one of the things it does is, remember I told you a little bit about some of these cells work, they pull holes in invading cells and kind of shoot chemicals in them. That's one of the things the complement does. And there's some illustrations that support that as well. Okay. That opsonization, so making something tasty so it can be ingested, it's like coating it. And you'll see when we look at the antibodies, which we're going to do soon, that antibodies have a place on the antibody molecule where complement can adhere, okay? And that literally does the opsonization or making tasty. I can relate to that. See, see this, maybe this is before, see, every time I, I would teach opsonization when I started doing this about 25 years ago, I'd mention, you know, a song that came from a very, very popular movie back in the 60s called Mary Poppins. Spoonful of sugar. Anybody? That's optionization 101. Love Mary Poppins. I have to tell that to my sister. She, when that book came out in the 50s, and my sister is five years, seven months, one day, and one hour older than I am, offhand. We're like that. Okay. Oh, come on. She was just in Spain last week. Give me a break. Are you kidding me? Oh, happy birthday. I'm at a tapas bar in Madrid.
where are the pictures? The last picture I have, and I lost it when I got new phones, was, that, was she and her husband in Paris. Oh, we're at Montmartre. We're at the Louvre. I'm at Primanti's in Pittsburgh. I'll send you a picture of the sandwich. Fries, slaw, the whole thing. Not quite the same as escargot somewhere in a, in a swanky restaurant in Paris. That's <laughs> okay. I'll get over it. So, but uh, she would, uh, when that book came out, she started, she would read it to me. I remember it acutely to this day. <sighs> and so I was just showing you some of the pictures with that. And what's fever? So fever, temperature, systemic response. Not every invader causes fever. Okay, there's always, a, like I said, that the idea of inflammation is going to create a certain amount of it. Certain agents have what are called pyrogens. And those pyrogens will definitely ramp it up because they'll affect the hypothalamus, which is kind of where our, our it's like setting the thermostat for our body. And it's, and it's accurately depicted there. It's, as, it's just like going home and pressing the buttons and resetting the temperature. Okay, so little things go on the liver and the spleen latch on to iron and zinc a lot of microorganisms need iron and zinc to replicate and so we sequester the, the liver and spleen hold on to it and more most importantly it increases metabolic rate our repair rate the problem is if it gets out of hand if we don't start to get a handle on it then the fever potentially is is, is very very real for it to be life-threatening and, and different things affect fever when I teach micro again, because it's sort of like the unit that reflects that. You guys were probably all immunized for chickenpox because the immunization came out in 1995. So you, I would get, it would be unusual for any of you to have had that. Okay. My kids all had it within two weeks of each other in order of their age from oldest to youngest in 1988. So that meant that the, the first one, I mean, so to understand they're not biological siblings, but you would think it was the same virus that impacted them. My, my eldest, we were delighted to get 104 fever, went to live with, his, with, with grandma. You know, we had the other two kids to handle. So grandma and grandpa took care of them and, and he was fine. I mean, he was sick, but he was fine. Two weeks later that day, my middle one got, got it maybe 101, 102 fever, didn't slow him down at all. Not in the least. We were very disappointed. We wanted him to get, you know, boy, that changed with my daughter. Two weeks later, okay, who was only two years old, ended up in the local hospital and nearly life flighted her to Pittsburgh, went to 106. So it affects different people differently. And in a, with the caveat that they are not biological siblings, so there's no genetic ties between any of them, but it can affect, different things affect different people differently. It would be the sum and substance of all that. And, and, and they just summarize these and that's everything there. So that's the introductory nugget that deals specifically, all of this is things that we have on board to fight things. And they work very effectively. Most of us do pretty well. I mean, yeah, I would say the person who was probably the sickest in this room was me. Don't start with the age thing. I could see you. She's sitting there going, yeah, it's old. I don't like any of you. I was telling my wife last night, I said, you know, it's tough getting, going to work every day. I get tired. She goes, you're not quitting yet. You have bills to pay. Yes, dear. Okay. We did have a good sale, though. We got some tickets for Southwest on sale at Costco. Love that. Like, like give Southwest gift cards. They were like, you know, like $425, 4 or 500 See you in December. Going warm. You should be happy about that. There's a very good chance your final is going to be on Blackboard. So I expect little notes. I hope you're having a great time in Orlando or Jacksonville. Don't bother us. We're at the theme. We're, we're at the theme park again. 
I can go on Space Mountain a few times. Okay. The adaptive immune system is, the other one is general. Okay. It's non-specific. Fighting inflammation, non-specific. Interferons, hardened cells for any kind of a virus. Okay. The complement works for any of those types of invaders. So it's nothing, the white blood cells address an invader or they address a bacteria or they address cell damage. It's just the way it is. But it is a non-specific generalized response. This is the opposite. If something has managed to penetrate the skin or linings and has somehow evaded being addressed by those innate medicines, now we have a major problem. We're at, and this system is nasty. Okay. Adaptive immune system, a specific defensive system that eliminates almost any or uh, pathogen or abnormal cells. So this is, there's a little bit of cancer involved in this too, as well as transplants and transfusions that are all come from this because they're viewed as foreign. And the biggest single thing I think that you can tell students, you know, in the process of learning about that is which one of these systems works on what. So if just in the bloodstream or sitting on top of a lining or on top of a cell anywhere we have, thank you. Somebody throw one of these out, would it kill you? Two. Ah, if you have a virus, a bacteria, okay, some type of cell, some type of cell damage on the surface. Some type of invader and they're not inside the cell. And for the lion's share of what our this system does, it activates antibodies. Okay, antibodies are mediated by something called B cells. They eventually generate the antibodies massively. And so for most of us, if you had COVID or you got that immunization, it basically, the, the immunization kind of makes the antibodies and pre-codes you to make antibodies like that in the future. Obviously, they've had to tinker with that because of the, the nature of that virus uh, mutating frequently, which they do. But that's a whole, that's a whole other lecture. That's there. If it's, if bacteria, which they do, like tuberculosis, or viruses, like they do, many of them are in a cell, if the cell is invaded and damaged and altered, that's word for that. Or if it's a cancer cell, which is immediately a totally different cell or a transfused or transplanted cell, it becomes under the heading of cell cellular immune system, which is mostly mediated by T cells. Now T cells help out both of these, but when we talk talking about cytotoxic or killer T cells, that's their category. That's what, if somebody has cancer, that's what's attacking. So that's really the, the first nugget about this. We The one that's easier to understand is the one that is B cells because the antibodies are fairly straightforward. They latch on to stuff. They immobilize it. They neutralize it. They hold on to it till macrophages can come along and by and large dispose of it. That's for their job. And they are very effective in doing it. That's why a lot of immunizations are able to do that. I mean, when we, and this is the unit where we talk a bit about immunizations. The beauty of them is that not only does what they're, what effectively they're trying to do is simulate a disease without making you sick. So back to the chicken pox. Chicken pox is, is, in some areas, it could be lethal, understand that. But the reality is that it's typically three, seven, three to seven days, relatively high fever, lots of pustules all over. That's what a pox means. And you scratch them like crazy, you get secondary bacteria.
we tossed our kids in a bathtub and in the old days, Avino, which is, makes a wonderful product line of skincare. At that time, they made one thing called colloidal oatmeal. And what it did was it stopped them from itching because it, it it, cal calamine and caladrol were not as effective. And so you show the boys in the bathtub like that. How this has all changed, okay? is not only when you get an immunization, do you not theoretically get the disease, okay? But effectively, it, it's like your hard drive. It pre-codes your hard drive to make antibodies rapidly to fight the disease if it ever comes near you, so much so that you won't even know it. Or if you know it, it'd be very, very transient. That's the idea behind them. Do they all work? No. Are they all good for you? No. Okay. So they're... You can't do anything invasive without potentially having complications. So the adaptive immune system is very, very specific. It plays a role amplifying the inflammatory response. Yes, it plays a role in activating complement. The big problem is time. So that initial exposure, it takes a while. Read that as several days for you to be able to ramp it up. So let's say you got a strep throat. Let's say you got a minor bacterial infection and you went to the doctor or you went to a med, you know, ur urgent care or wherever you went in the emergency room. And they said this, this, and this, and here's a prescription for what? Typically antibiotics, right? And normally it's for what? Seven to 10 days. Even if you get a Z-Pack, that's effectively a seven to 10 day course, but, but because of the way it's formulated, okay, it's timed release over that. It's, it's it, it, a lot of people think, oh, that's faster. It's not. It's just designed differently. It's be better for compliance. We only have to take, you know, a total of, of what, what, six pills. It's a lot easier than taking 40. In the old days, it was four times a day for 10 days. So it has a lot to do with compliance and side effects. Why is it that seven to 10 days that you have to take the antibody? It takes that long for your immune system to be primed. That's why it's, it's, it's not a guess. Oh, I think 10 days will do it. No. There's science behind it. So, and it depends. And like I said, it, it, there's, a, there's a lot of, you, you run into folks, and that's why I'm hoping to educate you to understand that there's a reason behind a lot of things that are, that are, that are prescribed or do, or the interactions you, many of you will have with patients to understand. Okay. Characteristics. It's specific. Antibodies for chicken pox are only going to fight chicken pox. Measles, they have nothing to do with it. Okay. COVID, not playing with it. Influenza, no help. Doesn't work that way. They're highly specific. They are all about, bless you, reacting to specific proteins that are on that particular item, whether it's a bacteria, virus, something on the surface, some irregularity, a fungus, let's say a protozoa, whatever it is, okay? It doesn't just go to the site. Like, I got a cut here, and there, or I twisted my ankle, and the inflammation was here. It's going all over the place. So it's systemic. You know, the concept is, if something is bad here, we might have trouble elsewhere. Let's, we're going to send this mass of chemicals all over the body. And that's a lot of times is why, some of the systemic illness symptoms, I'm tired, I've got a headache, I feel lousy, I feel nauseous, whatever they are, they're all coming from this fairly vigorous response would be a good word for that. Okay. The memory aspect. So any additional exposure, starting with the second, you respond more quickly to. So assuming that the infection agent hasn't changed, you're unlikely to get it again. I had, as a child, because we didn't have this abundance of immunizations, we all, we used to call them the usual childhood diseases. You just do a history. Oh, tell me, did you have the usual childhood diseases? Measles, mumps, chicken pox, German measles. Okay. MMR, measles, mumps, rubella, which is German measles. That's an immunization. Yeah, chicken pox. Varicella zoster, as it's known. You have an immunization for that. We had them. Okay. So I had them as a kid. Okay. And all but the mumps. And when I got married and we were going to have kids, we were going to try to have kids with my first wife. I got the mumps shot, which was available then. It had just really re relatively become available. 
but then was instructed that we weren't supposed to have, we have to wait three months just because of the potential that that could be a problem. And so I am my first marriage is in 1978. Don't start. Yeah, this year we would have been married 45 years. Maybe. Made it through 33. How long have you been married? 20 years. Oh, that's great. Yeah, 20 out of 30 ain't bad. I digress. So we, I never, I had those diseases with the exception of the mumps once, never had them again. Parents wanted you like what I was telling you with my kids, we were upset that my middle one hardly got sick. This, I, sorry, mom, I got to tell them this. If, when we all got the measles and the chicken pox, at the end of first grade, we had a whole neighborhood everybody had moved into. They'd moved out of the cities, out of New York and metropolitan New Jersey, into the suburbs, like, 20 minutes away from you, 20 miles from New York City. And they said, at the end of school, this this was the moms conspiring. Because they all had kids around, they all had kids around the same age, all in the same neighborhood, all moved in at the same time. We're going to the circus. Ringland Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus was at the old Madison Square Garden, 8th and 55th Street, New York City. If you're familiar at all with the city, it's now down 34th. And it's now it's old comparatively. And it, we all took the bus there. We all had lunch at the Automat. There's a very good thing on HBO about the Automat from Mel Brooks. And we all went to the circus. Within two weeks of being at the circus, we were all either had the measles or the chicken pox. This was, these were, they had chicken pox and measles parties. What would they say today? Oh my God. Should we, you, with social media, they had a chicken pox party. They should be arrested. This is what moms did. You see, you'd have been in trouble if you've been still around. I'm not joking. I, was, I can't make this up. The whole neighborhood, Briar Hill Circle in Springfield, New Jersey. In 1957. Look it up. We all went, that's what we did to create that memory. They wanted everybody to get sick. School was over. They could be at home. You were threatened with bodily harm. Here's what you, you have to stay in bed for the next week. Sure. Great. Do I get to eat and watch TV? Yeah. Oh, happy dance. What's wrong with that? Okay. So we have, we're going to talk about the antibiotic one called humoral. Again, humoral is fluid versus the cellular one or cell-mediated immunity. Humoral antibodies made by specific lymphocytes in the B cell line, the name of that cell eventually will be a plasma cell. They, it's, it's a change in a lymphocyte to basically an antibody factory. Okay, They attack the target, not necessarily the cell, but they may attack the cell or the virus or wherever it is in some way to inactivate it and basically tag it for some type of additional activity from immunological chemicals. Okay. The targets by and are extracellular. They can be sitting on the cell, but not in the cell. It all has to do with the markings. And this is a part that I you will not, that you will not be responsible for, but it's something to understand when something, when something goes in a cell and changes it, it changes the proteins and carbohydrates that stick out of the cell. That's how we identify things as being self or non-self. We have proteins all over that protrude from cell membranes. Those proteins have carbohydrates, many of them. They're called glycoproteins for sugar and protein. That's that whole ABO blood system. That's all about these little sugar chains that are out there. And so, what happens if they're changed by a virus like HIV inside of a cell, okay, it causes significant change and alters some of these markers. That's what triggers the other system. Okay. 
the cellular immunity, they go specifically on the target cell directly. They attack that cell. Or indirectly, they release chemicals that will effectively attack or damage the cell. And the targets are cells because those cells have changed markers. Their fancy names called MHC1 and MHC2 will get to. You're not going to have to go crazy about stuff like that. I'm not asking you to do that. Immunology, we have a, a, a senior level course that one of my colleagues teaches. Uh, if you had Dr. Maurer, he teaches a course. He has every other year he teaches immunology, not this year, next year. Okay. Antigens. Just like we talked about with the ABO system, all that stuff. Antigens, the original term was antibody generating. That's what I learned. Okay. We didn't know about any of this stuff. When I was taking courses in micro and about cell physiology, that was 1973 through 1977. That's what we talked about. How we anti, antigens and antigens by definition were foreign. We now know that we have self and non-self antigens. So they are non-self ones generate the antibody or another response. Self ones, our immune system in the first six months of life recognizes. Your immunity when you're born comes from your mom for roughly the first six months, while your immune system develops a certain degree of ability to discern what's there and what's not. Okay. So all of the adaptive immune responses are these better way to say it, foreign antigens. Okay. Most are not uh, are large complex, a virus, a bacteria. Okay. Sometimes they're incomplete. We call that a hapten, which is short for half antigen. That's an element that bonds to an existing protein in you and makes a complete antigen. Most of allergies are from that. So if you're have spring and fall allergies, if you have what they used to call hay fever, any of those types of things that are there, if you can't eat strawberries or whatever, those kinds of allergies are typically an element from what you're ingesting or co coming in contact with or inhaling and completing it and becoming an allergic molecule. The determinants are those spiked areas. Antibodies are made to those spikes specifically, that's what they latch on to. Effectively, what chemicals and white blood cells do is they roll all throughout. They're all over in your soft tissues, in the bloodstream, around organs, in fluids that surround them. And they roll over them. And as long as there's if nothing foreign is rolled over, it's not that they're smart. Just, they don't have eyes. They can't see. It's really it, it's adherence. So all of a sudden you have a cell that's got a marker like this, that that element, that antibody or that cell is programmed. When it hits it, it latches onto it. And that triggers a chain reaction that's totally vicious in an effort to destroy it. So much so it can make you sick. Okay. The immune system can kill you. Okay. There's no better evidence of that than... <clears throat> If you're familiar with the term anaphylactic shock, everybody knows somebody who has an EpiPen because they have bee stings, allergies, or nut allergies. If they don't get that in them fast, they could die. So antigens are sometimes incomplete. They have those determinants. And yes, they can be self antigens and your immune system will effectively leave them alone. So What's the big deal about them? They have the ability to stimulate specific lines of immune cells called lymphocytes, and they can react with them. And so these are all the things. Immunogenicity is the ability to, so assuming it's an antigen that we react to, that will basically, once it latches onto it, it'll trigger a response that'll make more lymphocytes active and come to the party. And there'll be a significant reaction either with the activated lymphocytes or inducing them to release antibodies. All of those things, foreign proteins, viruses, bacteria, foreign bodies, get a splinter. Okay. Sugars, 
lipids or oils, nut oils, or particularly when it comes to allergies, a big problem. Just walk into any place where you go into any grocery store and back to the bakery, you know, all those disclaimers, go to a restaurant, you know, we work with nut oils and glutens and blah, blah, blah. So be aware if you have certain limitations, be careful. That's what it gets. That's all liability based type of things. Pollens, microorganisms, all the things that you're probably familiar with. The haptins are again, are incomplete. They're relatively small. Okay, the immune system doesn't acknowledge them, but they become immunogenic when they combine together and complete this half antigen into a complete antigen. So the immune system will attack that, okay, because it attacks cell proteins as well as haptins. So there's interesting things that are part of it, and we see all of these. Poison ivy involves something called a resin. It's like an oil that gets into your skin. And it's interesting because it takes extra time. That comes from cellular immunity. That's an oddball. Animal dander. So if you, you know, we're fortunate in my house with a cat and a dog that we don't have any problems. Okay. But the animal dander is common. My, uh, my stepson, I mean, loves the cats, but he, <laughs> whenever he comes in, he's going out very quickly into the house. Okay. Detergents, different kinds of soaps. Maybe there's cosmetic lines. Now, a lot of people have to use, you know, hypoallergenic cosmetic lines and things like along that. There used to be a lot of foreign products for ye- We don't use them so much now. It's more chemically based. For years, moisturizing creams had one thing in common. Okay, they had lanolin. Okay, is it a name you're familiar with at all? Okay. They, the best moisturizers contain lanolin. They were great. That's the good news. There's the bad news. Lanolin is the fatty layer from sheep hide. In the old the original days, it was called sheep wool salve. Back in old, the old days. So when they were shearing the sheep or they were butchering the sheep, they would take the, take that fatty layer. And it's like ambergris from whales. They would boil down the fat from whales and make oils that eventually played a role in making not just heating and cooking, but also ended up in perfumes and things like that. So that that's why the, the whale, like Moby Dick, famous book. Call me Ishmael. Am I ringing a bell? Don't they have a library over there? Moby Dick, Great White Whale. Okay, so the antigen that it responds to are the determinants. Those are the irregularities that we make the antibodies to. They're the irregularities that we create on that killer cell to attack. And it's strictly to do with with these determinants. Okay, most naturally occurring antigens have a lot of these and they work on different populations. And they form different kinds of antibodies. Interestingly, when you have a polymers, which are relatively new, plastics and things like that, are things that have what they call relatively low antigenicity. So a lot of the original, what we would do in joint implantation is they were made out of high density poly, like uh, you're familiar with the hip anatomy. So the socket for the hip, the acetabulum, the prosthesis, the artificial portion would be a plastic made out of high density polyethylene. Okay. The head and neck apparatus would be a coated metal and that would form a hip prosthesis. That was designed for a couple of reasons because it was unlikely to create little shards. Metal against metal would create little pieces. That could be a problem. So a lot of suture material. Stitches are made out of, for a long time, they were, the ones I used a lot in the skin because you would remove them were made out of nylon, monofilament nylon. Again, it was something that low, low immunogenicity. Metallic implants that we use in bones. Early, now they've changed the metallurgy of it, but originally they were made out of stainless steel. And still a lot of them are because you don't respond to them. So 
there's a lot material science plays a role in a lot of this. So that's why that's an important nugget that's there. There's not, a, there's, there's not a lot of irregularities in that to create foreign things. So this is what it looks like. So you can see the way they've done. The determinant is the shape of whatever, let's say that's a bacteria and it's got little prongs. COVID was just like that. COVID was a virus that had markers, okay, called protein spikes. And those protein spikes would attach to things in your lung and rather than suppress inflammation, they would be called pro-inflammatories. They released chemicals that made it almost impossible to breathe and had, and then you had a wide range of immunological responses. Most of the time when you get a virus, the damage is from your immune system. When you have a bacterial infection, the damage is from toxins that the bacteria makes. So when someone gets a food infection from E. coli, it's about the toxins that are damaging the lining of the gut or salmonella. Okay. With a virus like a cold, just take a, a minor virus, like the cold, a cold or a mild flu-like presentation, it's your immune system. Eyes, water, scratchy throat. Those are generalized inflammatory things, increasing in drainage. So all of these determinants or binding sites are very specific. And you, they've given you three different shapes. And the antibodies, which typically have that letter Y appearance, how do they attach by being, as you can see, like on the one that's way over here, being very shape specific, the one that has like the little, looks like the little knob on one of these guys. So we're covered with a variety. So all cells have all of these antigens and that's what our bodies have gotten used to. Okay. But if we use them, if you're a graft, if somebody was donating a kidney, we have to look for things to make it very compatible. Okay. We can't. So typically someone who donates a kidney to somebody else, they're either, they may be related or at least be genetically compatible. Okay. These are based on this group of what they call MHC. It's got a fancy name, major histocompatibility complex. Com Histo means tissue. Compatibility is just that. Okay. And yes, they're unique to individuals. And so when they're looking for a donor for a kidney, let's say a, a church population says, we, we, you know, somebody's going to die if we don't get a kidney. And, you know, you, you, you've got two, it's a spare part. And you only need about a quarter of one for you to, for it to work, for you not to have any problems. And we have a lot of extra kidney stuff whether somebody would choose to donate that or not is, is, is a whole different uh, set of parameters. What happens is they screen. Anybody's interested, they do blood tests. And let's say they're test arbitrarily for 100 of these MHC proteins. And if you have 75 that are the same as the person who needs the transplant, you would probably be classified as a, as a desirable donor. That's kind of how they do it. They screen for those things that are there. And when we get to T cells, it's very specific about these MHC proteins. And again, that's not the stuff that we're going to be spending a lot of time with. So you have B cells and T cells and specialized white blood cells that are like macrophages. You have them in the liver, you have them in the skin, you have them in the gut, you have them in the spleen and that white pulp area and lymph nodes. They are called antigen presenting cells. And effectively what they do, if this little nub is the determinant, the antigen presenting cell gobbles it up. And what it does, it sticks it out of the cell, just a little nub like this. And that, and it presents it to a B or T cell population say, this is the problem right here. Make more cells or make antibodies that will address or attach to this particular problem. So it doesn't need the whole cell or the whole virus or the whole bacteria. It just needs that determined. So that's the antigen. So they're, they're, they're not, they're an indispensable part of the immune system, but they're not the cellular element per se. That's there. And so we go through a whole thing about how they grow and develop. And they're here. So B cells and T cells, they're both born in the bone marrow. So B cells are born in the bone marrow. 
and they mature in the bone marrow. T cells are born in the bone marrow, okay, and they mature in the thymus. That's what gives them the, that's why they're a T cell, not a B cell. Let me just show that to you. That's here. So the thymus line becomes the T cell line, the bone marrow line becomes the B cell line. So the maturation process doesn't take particularly long, okay? And they mature in lymphoid organ, organs, the B cells in the bone marrow. They can in the thymus as well, but in generally what happens in the thymus, okay, it, there's a whole process. One of the problems when someone has an immunological disease, okay, is their immune cells attack them. If you know somebody with multiple sclerosis or somebody with rheumatoid arthritis or somebody with systemic lupus erythematosus, all diseases we'll talk about in this unit that are here. Those are immune disorders. And it means that your white blood cells, for whatever reason, are misprogrammed. And so either your antibodies are damaging you or the white blood cells are damaging you. And sometimes that can be brought on by a bacterial infection, like a strep throat, famously. So there's different things that do it. And in order to educate them, they have to be competent. So they have to be able to recognize an antigen and they have to be self-tolerant. So they have to not attack your, and so it's very hard. Uh, T cells, only about 2% of T cells actually eventually are utilized of all the ones that are produced. So it's, a, it's rather difficult. Okay. And then what happens once they've reached this maturity, whether they're in the bone marrow of their B or T cells, the fancy term we use is called naive. That means they haven't encountered a bad guy. So even though they're, they're immunocompetent, they're not active. If they're not, not, if they're naive, when they finally encounter a bad guy, we call them active. And then they go all over the place. Lymph nodes, spleen, blah, 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 like that. Same picture. And then when they activate, they trigger the lymphocyte to develop further. Okay. And the term that we use is called clonal selection. They just make multiples of themselves. They clone themselves. Like down here at the bottom of that, those are the clones. <coughs> so the clones, and there's most of them become what are called effector cells. They're either going to go out and attach themselves to the cell, or they're going to produce tremendous amounts of antibodies that are going to go out and attack whatever is causing the problem. A handful of them become memory cells. That's the long-term immunological memory. That's the beauty of the system. So B and T memory cells and effective T cells are always out there circulating. It's genetically based. Your genes are the are basically the guidebook to make proteins. And, and I say it all the time, you are what your proteins say you are. We, we are what we are genetically for the most part. Okay. So a variety of these receptors are genetic knowledge of microbes. So you can see up all these 25,000 different genes code up for a billion types of lymphocyte antigen receptors. So there's a tremendous amount of them and a tremendous amount of ways that they can, they can vary. So there's nothing, it's almost impossible to even discuss. Okay. T cells, they undergo the T cells, have what's called positive and negative selection. It's not a big deal for us. They have to be able to recognize something that's self. Okay. And if for some reason they bond to something that's self, they will undergo apoptosis. They'll destroy themselves. That clone. That's there. And so there's a whole big way of this doing when they talk about positive and negative selection. And again, it's, it's not anything for, for you folks. And then uh, maybe lastly, uh, before we get into the specifics, these are the different cells that are the antigen presenting cells. Some of them are B cells. Most of them are, are these dendritic, these long arm cells in the skin and the nervous system, in the liver, a variety of different macrophages are there. 
And so those are the ones I was trying to demonstrate with. They're in, usually in the boundary tissues. Okay. And so what they do is they basically grab onto the invader, go into the lymph, go to the lymph node, show them the determinant that's foreign. And so it's a, it's a vital link between your innate system, which they're technically part of, and the adaptive system, which they're technically activating. And then that's a, and it's a very good illustration of one of these dendritic for long arm cells that are there. Macrophages are everywhere. And once they're active, they just gobble up everything. The B lymphocytes are interesting. This is more in the most advanced area. You'll see it in an illustration. The single most important cell in your immune system is called the helper T cell. Its name says everything about it. It's a T cell. It doesn't, it basically produces chemicals when it's activated to activate both the B cell line and if needed, the T cell line. And it produces chemicals that reinforce the innate system if that system has been activated. That is the kind of cell, the helper T cell. It's called a CD4 helper T cell. And the problem with it is that in HIV, that is the cell line that is attacked. HIV targets that particular cell and either it destroys the cell upon impacting it or it changes continuously all of the cells in that line. So effectively, the definition of the transition between someone who is HIV positive, which is treatable, and people can live a full life, okay, if it's caught early enough and they take good care of themselves and take all the appropriate medicines, etc. But if they do not, it will transition into AIDS, which stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And what that means is their helper T cell line has fallen below a critical number. And at that point, your immune system fails. And sooner or later, you're going to succumb to an infection, to a cancer, to a combination thereof. That's the distinction. Okay. It's a long process. It takes typically between two and 10 years for someone who is untreated to with HIV or undertreated to go into AIDS. But once they have AIDS, they're, by definition, their lifespan is short. And that's what meant by fatal. If you did not know. So it just kind of summarizes those kinds of things. B cells are what we're going to deal with next time we meet in lecture, which will be a week from today. Okay. For the lecture part, it's Tuesday. We have a test, right? See, I remember. I just send a test in to be copied. So if you have questions, you're supposed to, you're supposed to let me know about that. When the B cells are activated, and it's going to eventually trigger what we're going to see. And then you're going to see the cells that make these antibodies um, other than the ones that have the memory are going to eventually, most of that line is going to morph into something called plasma cells. And as you can see, when they start to make antibodies, thousands of molecules a second for days, and then they basically die. And so when we start to ramp up and make antibodies, we make a lot. So we'll leave it there. All right, everybody. I'll see you this afternoon. We're doing respiratory. We'll be breathing up there. <laughs>